Sablefish. This luxurious BC seafood is a delicacy around the world. But more importantly, it's sustainable. Today, Rob and I are going to explore the lengths that Canadian sable fishermen go to to ensure that this beautiful fish is available for generations to come. I'm Robert Clark. As a chef, I have spent my entire career in the pursuit of sustainable seafood. I'm Carmen Ruiz Ilaza. As a consumer, I've made sourcing local Canadian seafood my mission. Rob and I are going to take you on a journey. We're going to meet the men and women that bring the sea to our tables. Rob and I are in Victoria, British Columbia, and we're here for Sablefish. So Chef, you've brought us to Victoria, the capital of BC. Why are we here? Two words. <laughs> yeah. Bob for Maine. On this season, I've learned that fishermen are a different breed. And Bob Fermani is maybe the most different of them all. He's connected to a lot of different fisheries, but uh, my connection with Bob going back 20, 25 years is with sablefish. Robert, I so want to introduce to you. you to Carmen. No. This is Bob Hi, Fermani. Bob. Okay, I love it. Hi, Bob. Yes. Nice to see really you. Beautiful. This is, okay, enough flirting. <laughs> Bob has been harvesting sable fish since the late 70s, and he was one of the founding members of the Canadian Sablefish Association. He's a fisherman, processor, retailer, and a bistro owner. He invited Rob and I to his restaurant to host a dinner for some of the original sablefish license holders. Rob will be preparing a sablefish feast. Oh, Anna, Anna, this is great. Well, I get to chat with the who's who of the industry. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the history of the beginning of sablefish. There was a fishery of foreign vessels yeah. that were allowed in as close as 12 miles, and they would sometimes come closer because no one was patrolling them. They were just hammering our coast. And then um, most countries in the world claimed a 200 mile limit in it was 1977. Yeah. As I understand, I know that you were one of the originators, Bob, and and you too, right, Deacon? I've been involved, yes, for years. One of the old sea dogs. Mm, the sea dogs, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we started fishing sablefish in 1979, and uh, it's a frozen product and we take it down to minus 40 degrees, holding at minus 35. So you've got an excellent fresh product. Cue Rob for Sablefish 101. This is what a real whole sablefish looks like. And the reason why uh, we generally never see them with the heads on is, is uh, sablefish is very uh, perishable because of the high rich oil content. So they freeze them at sea. So if this one I've taken uh, the guts out and I've scaled it. And quite simply, I'm going to show you basically what we would we would normally get in the marketplace, whether it's at the restaurant or in your local fishmonger. This is called a J cut. So everything's gone, it's been cleaned, and this has been done at sea. This, in my opinion, is one of the best parts of the sable fish. These are the uh, collars. There's a high demand for them, so they sell them separately from from the whole fish. This is my favorite part, quite frankly. Okay, now with sable fish, it has a, a, a row of bones running down the center. In a salmon, that would be called pin bones, but for sable fish, they're not pin bones. They're, they're hooked to the skin, so they're impossible to remove uh, while the fish is uh, raw. So we have one or two choices. I prefer to cook it with the bone in, but if you're buying this in, in, a, in a fishmonger, your local fishmonger or something, they may very well have taken taking the bones out for you. But once the fish is cooked, these bones kind of pop up and they remove quite easily. So that's how I prefer to do it. Sablefish is definitely luxurious, but catching it is hard work. You can't do this as a job, because if you do it as a job, you're not gonna last, I guarantee it. Because there's so many days when it's hell. You know, you might die. You've seen God a few times, you know, and then there's you know, the times where it's just tough and you're hanging on because the boat's rolling so hard. And 
and you, you know your legs are tired just from you know, spread way out and you're trying to clean the fish to pick them up off the deck or you've got breakdowns in the engine room you're crawling under a hot engine and the bilge water is coming up to your ear and you're burning your arm as you're trying to get underneath and change an alternator or, Deacon knows how dangerous things can get. In the early days, he was aboard a ship that was lost at sea. Ah, uh, we still don't know after the investigation, but it rolled over and sank, and we lost two crew members oh. that time. Oh, dear God. Were you on board? Hmm? Yeah, I was. Oh, you were? Okay. Time we untie from the dock. You don't know. Yeah. Rob and I are in Victoria hosting a dinner for the founders of the stable fish industry. While Rob prepares his next course, I delve deeper into how the sable fish fishermen ensured that this industry remains sustainable for generations to come. This is the thing that I've learned. It's just how serious the fishermen are about preservation, sustainability. I think the involvement that the fishermen have had with this fishery has given us all ownership. Another fisherman who's been around since the beginning is Chris Atchison. The old days of sablefish fishing, it was like the Wild West. It was, you could use as much gear you wanted. To. There was lots of time to fish. It was just basically a how much you could catch. Thankfully, now things are better managed. In the mid 80s, I went to the rest of the sablefish fishermen and said, hey, we gotta pull ourselves together and go to government and try to help manage this fisheries ourselves. From there, we went to government and said, hey, we would like to partner with you. Can we be part of this management process? The Sablefish Association pioneered this style of resource management to the benefit of both the Sablefish stocks and the fishermen. Rob Cronlin spent years working for the Canadian Department of Fisheries. He explains how this conservation system works. The research program started tagging fish in the late 80s uh, and ramped it up through the 90s and it's continued to this day. The fish are tagged uh, from uh, the southern border of BC to, to the northern border and the tag information is returned back uh, and from that we get uh, an indication of movement. Bravo 99 In addition to fish tagging, the industry uses monitoring cameras to verify the number of fish harvested, as well as trap cameras to investigate the effects of fishing gear on the ocean floor. It was a time when the stock status had started to drop. And I, Rob came to us and said, we're gonna fix this, and I'm not leaving till it's done. So there was a problem and you guys all got together. Well, we're never gonna say it's fixed, but we're saying that we're in a positive growth and we wanna keep it that way. The Sablefish Association, which is funded by the 48 license holders, invests heavily in science and research. It's a two mile square, we set there, we set there. Once a year, the Sablefish Association contracts one of its vessels to do a six week survey trip. Skipper Deacon is heading out to do stock assessment and monitoring. Well, the way we set our gear, we, we deploy a set of buoys, and then our boy line, of course, so that you have markers for your gear. And then every 25 fathom or 150 feet, a trap goes out, which is baited. We bait it with squid and hake, and we set 25 of them. That's basically how you set. And then when we're hauling, we come up to the end, we grab the boy and come aboard. And then as the traps come aboard, there's a, a tub out there that we dump our fish into. And then the science staff goes to work. The science staff have all their numbers, they do their weights, they do everything. 
Then at the end of a day of hauling, they take the hard drive out and then they watch it again and compare their numbers with that. So uh, there's no mistakes made. And uh, it, it's been a great system. Rob is finishing his first course, featuring his favorite part of the sable fish, the collars. But these, I love collars. They're so uh, they're so succulent. Basically, just a little spice blend of ground up uh, seaweed. I've used macro kelp, uh, some smoked paprika, and quite a bit of uh, sumac. When I was trying to remove unsustainable seafood from the menus of my restaurants, sable fish was a revelation. The fact that it was so rich and buttery made it easy for me to remove items like Chilean sea bass. <laughs> oh, wow! Yeah, I like some sauce dripping in there. I can remember It's good time. times though when you think yeah. that. <laughs> you made it. The good old days. Back at Finest at Sea, Rob and I have put together a dinner with some of the industry founders. I put together a sable fish menu with Chef Anna Hunt. Anna is the executive chef at Finest at Sea, so she knows a thing or two about sable fish. This is the candied sable fish, which is one of Finest at Sea's star smoked products. A little bit sweet, a little bit spicy. Kind of like the owner. <laughs> Rob's been telling me about the sable candy for months, so we headed next door to meet Rich at the processing plant. When our big boat, the Ocean Pearl, unloads, at the end of that, there's all the little pieces and bits and pieces that are sitting down on the bottom of the fish hold that used to just get thrown away. Well, now we take all that and we process it in our little plant here and get all those little pieces and make sable fish candy. Well, I was willing to get on a BC ferry to come over <laughs> That's and get right. some. So, so I'm definitely like, come on, that. give me my yeah. share. Yeah. Oh, it smells great in here. Yeah, these are our uh, Mauer custom smoke houses. Whoa! Uh, we'll cold smoke it for two full days. Um, but we're cutting some sable fish right now so we can go and have a look. Yeah. Wow. This is our cutting plant, cutting room in our fish plant. And what we have here is, is uh, Adam, and he is trimming some four or five sable fish from the Ocean Pearl. As you can see, he's cut uh, six fish here, and they're all good. So we can, from there, we can sell them as is. We can uh, vacuum seal and freeze them and sell them. That's typically how we sell them to restaurants. Or we can vacuum seal, seal them and freeze them in six ounce portions. So we're cutting fish every day here for your shop. Every day. Every day. Every morning, everything's turned over in our shops. And uh, every day, every morning, we're cutting fish for many of the restaurants in Victoria. Rich has been working with Bob since he was 12. I was uh, a commercial fisherman as a young man. And uh, I fished on, on Bob's long liners for several years as a deckhand and was being groomed to, to start running boats for him and uh, a, a bad family situation for me uh, made it so that I could not be at sea uh, eight, nine months of the year fishing. So I had to give up being a fisherman, which was my passion and dream. Bob came and found me and said, you know, why don't you come run our operation in Victoria here at the fish plant and learn about the processes and how to cut fish and do all the things that he wants done. Needless to say, Rich is a big fan of sable fish. It's such a versatile fish to, to use and as you as a chef would know to cook with yeah. because it just cooks so evenly and is so, so succulent and just so good. So what we have here is some roasted smoked sable fish. Sometimes it's uh, poached in, in milk or, or water or something. I like to, uh, in this case, when I'm adding it to a soup or something, I like to roast it. It, it kind of dries it out, changes the texture a little bit, and gives it some mouthfeel for when we, uh, when we place it in the bowls. So it's dashy, but it's soba dashy, so it's 
seaweed and, and bonito, but then I've added some mirin and some soy sauce to it. And what we've garnished it with is uh, sablefish candy. Uh, we got some uh, smoked sablefish that I've roasted in the oven now. I've, and then we have some seaweed. Uh, this is mackerel kelp. Please, please enjoy. So the smell is just coming out. <laughs> Unbelievable. Thank you. Brought to you in part by Ocean Regenerative Aquaculture and CKR Seaweed. Your Nation's Table is brought to you in part by Cedar Creek Estate Winery. All the smoke. Oh my goodness, Robert. You are gonna I, get to I, As I was right. eating it, I couldn't, oh, I think I like the candy. Oh no, I like the smoke. Oh, I like the candy. Back in Victoria, Rob continues serving up a feast at the Sablefish Founders Dinner. Our third course is braised sablefish with garlic and tomato, black olive polenta, and seaweed. So chef, I know that you uh, use a lot of seaweed from Ocean Regenerative. Yes. Have you ever, ever used mackerel kelp? I have like, not. Have you not? So, what for the dishes that I've done today for uh, the soup? Yeah. Let's just soak it. I'm just going to throw it in there. Going to cook it for a couple of minutes. It's just going to enhance the flavor of the tomato. And it gives such a do? great texture. And texture. I love the texture, texture. of kelp. When I'm when this, I'm using seaweed as a vegetable, especially uh, mackerel kelp, I don't really want to cook it a lot. I, I like it just it's just there for texture uh, and to uh, add some umami or some flavor to. Uh, to the sauce, so, so that's great for me, that's ready. So what we're doing here now is, so this is just like a pepper knot or something, it's peppers, tomatoes, fennel, onions, and I've, uh, I've added some uh, mackerel kelp, some seaweed, just to, to take it up a notch, make it that much more special. And this is just the, the garnish for uh, our sablefish dish, which we just simply roasted. This is a crispy polenta with black olives. So why we're pulling the skin back a little bit is because I've purposely left the, the bones in. So I want that to be very easy for the dining guests to, uh, to split the fish and uh, see the bones. The changes that you've seen since you started Thank you. the association and you've had such immense success from my point of view in what you've achieved, what is the loftiest goal that you could imagine for the Sablefish Association? I just think the sustainability of the fishery and making sure there's quota there for the future. That is, that is important to me. I look down the road a little bit and say, we have to look after this fishery for children, grandchildren, whatever. It's important that we do that. People talk a lot about sustainable fishing and, and what it means to have a sustainable fishery, but it, it's a very disciplined process in, in practice. Uh, it's easy to say it's harder to do. You need to be clear about objectives that you need for the stock and fishery. You need to invest in new data and new information to improve your understanding of the stock. You need to have an assessment to tell uh, which direction the stock is going and whether or not you're meeting uh, the targets that you set out and the objectives. You know, it's a great resource for Canada, you know, and, and it needs to be managed by Canadians and needs to be fished by Canadians. First try! Second try! Yes! It's remarkable what you got going on here, Bob. I can't thank Anna enough for actually holding my hand. <laughs> and walking me through this. So what we have is I've just made like a pepernata, like peppers, onions, fennel, some seaweed, some olive oil, some garlic is the, is the sauce on the bottom. Then we have some black olive polenta. The sable fish has just been simply roasted. Uh, a little bit of pesto on top, a little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil. Uh, please enjoy. This I think is going to be the best pairing with the wine from Cedar Creek. Dig in, and uh, thank you so much for entertaining me this afternoon. <laughs> and us. Wow. Robert, wow. Oh, it's so tasty. Right? Yeah. Perfect. Really, I love it now.
Oh, it was just, it was a pleasure to have you guys all here today, and it's a pleasure every day to get to work with this beautiful product, and it's just, it's, it's a dream, really, it's wonderful, and it's great to be a part of the finest family, and it really is a family, like the whole, yeah, I've never not felt like a part of Bob's family. Here's to the yeah. family, Bob. Here's to the family, shared. I know, <laughs> he's got so many kids to look after. <laughs> I really need to express my gratitude um, on behalf of myself and the hospitality community, the, the consumer community for the efforts, the work that you guys do as food producers here in British Columbia and in Canada. How important it is to support our local food producers, our food suppliers, and not for the guys that, that, that wild harvest products and go out and see and risk their lives. And, but so, and I, I respect what you guys do so much, and I can't say enough. Here's to you guys. Oh, here, please, yeah. please you. keep up Here's the chef. excellent management. Yeah. And the culinary and ensuring wow. that we can continue. Rob, I forgot you did it early today. Yeah. Wow. Well said. Cheers. Cheers.